Um, hi, my name is uh, Christian. Uh, together with my colleague Christiana, we are going to talk about OpenStack in the enterprise and uh, how our company is planning to make some internal charging out of it. Let's not focus on the getting your money part because right now it's tricky. Um, <laughs> That's yeah. money. Uh, that is money, come on. It's not that bad of a deal. So early on uh, in the stocks, I've noticed that uh, there was a lot of AWS being thrown around. There was actually an Ansible session specifically targeted on launching stuff on AWS. So how many of you guys in the room are actually using the public cloud right now? Or at least have heard of it? Okay. One, we've heard two. of it, but we're not using it. We're not using it. Okay. At least you've heard of it, so that's good. So considering that, I'm not even going to ask how many of you are either familiar or using OpenStack because apparently there's very little. Uh, so this is going to be an introductory uh, discussion about what OpenStack is. And uh, Christi uh, Christiana is going to go a bit uh, more in depth on a specific component of OpenStack that we use uh, in order to charge people for using it. So OpenStack, or let's first talk to the cloud because there was very little. Response to my initial, initial question, the cloud, according to an organization called NIST, is something that's supposed to be uh, ubiquitous. It should be a shared resource pool accessible over the network. Uh, there's some key words there. One is ubiquitous, so everywhere, so anytime you need it. It's shared and it's a resource pool, so you're consuming something that other people may consume as well. And it's accessible over the network. The network part is actually critical and I'm gonna come back a bit on it because uh, it's quite important to the way you consume it. Um, what is OpenStack? It's uh, an open source cloud software implementation. It was initially built as a response to the larger public cloud offerings, which at the time they were closed source. The current release uh, saw contributions from around 160 organizations, some of them actually adverse to open source. Like if you look at the change logs for the Mitaka release, you will see contributions from Microsoft, VMware, I, IBM is now an open source friendly company, but it didn't used to be like that all the time. And according to some marketing research, uh, it's supposed to be uh, adopted in the larger enterprises, so Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies within two years, everybody will likely have something either uh, at an early stage of adoption or even in production. Um, I just came back from uh, the OpenStack Summit two weeks ago and Gartner was present on the stage and they said that OpenStack now has co uh, crossed what marketers called the chasm. Uh, if you know the um, uh, law of uh, diffusion of innovation, there is a gap between early adopters and your early majority. It's around 17.5% adoption. OpenStack is now roughly 33% in production deployments. So it's well beyond that uh, early adopter phase where it was nice, it was open sourced, like Linux kernel 1995-ish. Now we're about 2000 something. So it's still building, but it's gathering momentum. So think about OpenStack in the enterprise. Now it's not, it could be a public cloud, but it's also uh, given to hosting inside the enterprise and it's the actual enterprises who are pushing much harder than the public cloud offerings. Because in a public cloud you have AWS, you have Azure, you have Google, these are big players it's tough to compete against them. It's uh, either you find a niche or you just go away. And OpenStack isn't really on par to fully compete, but in the enterprise, it will offer you a uh, degree of agility that you can get in the pu uh, public cloud, but within the safety and confines of your own data center. So right now, you should ask yourself, are you in the business of building out data centers? Most of the guys here in the room are either developers or DevOps. So I guess, or I hope none of you are actually focusing on building the walls, maintaining power and cooling, and making sure that you have the latest CPU that was in the market last month. Uh, hardware is getting old. Uh, initially, before marketing corrected my slides, I, said, I was saying hardware is 
sucks. Why not? You don't really want to worry about what hardware you're gonna get. You just want hardware to run an application on, and ideally, you don't even want to know what hardware. <coughs> Think about AWS Lambda, serverless applications. This is where we're going. OpenStack is helping us on the road there. One other thing you don't want to worry about as a developer, don't want to worry about the network. Network is complicated. I come from a telco company, I know. Network is insanely complicated. We like to build networks, and they're not easy to build. Um, the window of opportunity is something that you as a developer, or even as an entrepreneur, you really, really care about. When you build something, you want to know that you're targeting users that are going to use this application, maybe in, uh, next week, next month, but usually the window of opportunity becomes very, very uh, narrow. So when you build a data center, it takes like I don't know, one or two years to plan, one or two years to build, so in five years you might start delivering your application from there. This thing you don't really need to worry about as long as somebody, somebody is running it for you or if you have a data center or an infrastructure team that's running it for you as part of your larger enterprise. Um, now, OpenStack is not really trying to t uh, take over the world or change it, uh, except for the better. For the developers, for the application consumers, as I said, I, uh, I attended the OpenStack Summit two weeks ago and Gardner was up on stage promoting what they call their new bimodal IT model. Uh, kind of crazy, but that's how they call it. Uh, basically means you have this new environment built either on the public cloud or hybrid or internal cloud that's agile, it's able to deliver you uh, resources on demand, it's there, it works, everything's nice. You can deliver applications at the click of a button at, at the call of the API, but you still have your core applications. You still have your CRM, you still have your billing, your warehouse management, your uh, whatnot, that basically you don't want to lose your data. Uh, you don't want to interfere, you don't want to have it go down. OpenStack's not yet at the point where it will take over that system. Those still need to coexist. OpenStack is helping you um, <coughs> interconnect with those systems. So it's a cloud-like environment that helps you develop applications that can plug into those backend systems. So you don't need to apply the same uh, arcane security guide, uh, security rules, the same arcane operations, uh, procedures, and whatnot for your social media app. That's supposed to change every other week because there's a new trend coming out. And uh, I think Tim was talking about uh, their BBC application that basically gets hammered when Kanye West tweets something. You don't want to have that hammer your CRM backend. So you want to have that in a cloud um, in a shared resource pool that's able to scale on demand. And this is what um, OpenStack empowers the organization to do. Deliver resources to tenants, deliver um, resources to developers, scale the applications mm -hmm. that those developers build without having to worry about how those applications are gonna scale. You start, as a developer, you start writing your environment. You're not no longer making requests, you're writing code to build that environment for you. Um, so, what's actually behind the box? Because I said OpenStack, there's actually, OpenStack itself is an umbrella. There's a lot of projects under the guidance of the OpenStack umbrella organization. Um, so, let's go into a bit of a basics. You have your identity service, it's called Keystone. Then you have your computing uh, manager, it's called Nova. It was built by uh, NASA together with Rackspace. They started out with roughly 2010. Um, from that uh, Nova component, you started to see specialized services and you have now a block storage service called Cinder. You have a uh, template and image management which is called Clans. Uh, Rackspace, when <coughs> they started contributing to OpenStack, they brought uh, into the picture their object storage. At the time it was called uh, Rackspace Hosted Files. Now it's called Swift, the, the OpenStack name for it. Um, later on, you had your developer-focused applications in the form of the telemetry service and the orchestration service, basically the telemetry gathers metrics. The, telem uh, the orchestration service reacts on those <coughs> metrics and it's able to scale our resources up and down. For any of uh, the guys in the room familiar with AWS, 
uh, the orchestration the service called HIT delivers something called uh, auto-scaling groups, which are the roughly equivalent of auto-scaling groups in AWS. You basically set a metric here in the telemetry service. You say, I want to scale up when my overall uh, CPU consumption reaches 70%, and that component over there is gonna take care of scaling it up. As long as you properly wrote your application to be stateless, it's going to add another compute, another instance to your mix. It's going to push it into your load balancer configuration, and there you have it. You can basically handle the traffic that Kanye West sent your way. Uh, Okay, um, two more things there. The networking service, as I said, network is very, very hard usually. There's a dedicated component in there called Neutron. Start that with says Quantum. For some reason, the Quantum comp Corporation didn't like that, so they sued the hell out of uh, the OpenStack guys, and now it's called Neutron. And you also have a web uh, GUI for it. Uh, it's called Horizon. So I'd like to say it looks like the AWS console, but it doesn't. It looks horrible, but it's usable. Um, now, Orange started to use this quite early on. I mean, um, the purpose of this talk was to share with you our experience on building this, not just make you aware of what OpenStack is. So this is the part where I'm gonna say a few words about how we started. Um, we started roughly 2013 with a Havana release. Uh, OpenStack has this release every six months. They have a, um, a summit every six months a design summit where developers and operators and other contributors and stakeholders meet, discuss what they'd like to have in six months time, and then after six months they uh, tag a git release and that's it. That's basically our overall OpenStack. The all projects under the OpenStack umbrella, they stamp their current stage at the release time and they give it a fancy name. Usually it's in alphabetical order. Started out with Atlanta. Uh, we started out at Havana. The current release is called Mitaka. Usually it's something related to the place where they host the design summit. Mitaka comes from Tokyo. It's, it's uh, I don't know, either a place or some sort of food. Something related to Japan, anyway. Um, we experimented uh, very early on with uh, how to run the thing. We are a large enterprise organization, so we made assumptions that, yeah, it looks like the cloud, it eats like quack like the cloud, should be the cloud, but we want it to behave like VMware. Uh, turns out the cloud isn't really VMware. VMware is put a stamp on their product and called it the cloud. That's not what, what OpenStack is trying to achieve. Um, one very early lesson that we learned the hard way is that HA in the cloud is tough to do. At the time when we started with Havana, it was even tougher. Uh, it's nice to have in production, but when you adopt open source early on, you start picking apart things that actually work and start building on those. Um, and about building that, we discovered that there are some missing functionalities in OpenStack at the time. And Op uh, Orange actually contributed on our core competencies, so the network, uh, two projects. One is called L2 Population, and if anybody is interested, uh, we can discuss it uh, offline, what it is. And the second one is called Bagpipe VPN. These are functionalities built into Neutron and currently in uh, wide availability. Um, then our next step was to move that POC under the desk kind of deployment to something that somebody could actually get their hands on. So we built something that we called V1 and I actually crossed out rocket for some reason. <laughs> it came back on me. Uh, we called it Pilot V1. Uh, it was built on the ice house release, so the next release, which started having various features that we liked. For once, we had HA in the control plane. Networking was still not HA, but we started to experiment on how we'd like to have that thing in production. Uh, basically, got uh, into discussion with tenants what they wanted. We um, actually got one particular project that was very brave to put their sort of like production environment on our pre-alpha testing thing. Uh, it was great for us because we got very early feedback. It was horrible for us because we were co pulled into calls late in the evening because something broke on something that we didn't have monitoring on, but it was still great. Um, the key point here is get very early feedback when you're building something. And this doesn't apply just for OpenStack. In our particular case, because we were adopting an early uh, open source project, 
it became critical to start focusing our energies and um, also the community towards things that matter in production. Um, then we act, we moved through uh, to a second pilot. The move to the second pilot was kind of tough because we still built on uh, ice house. We added some HA into the mix, but we asked our uh, tenants nicely to move over. And when you're telling somebody you need to move your thing, and at the end of the month I'm gonna close the whole thing. Uh, so one key learning here is try to provide some sort of migration mechanism to your uh, stakeholders. Again, doesn't apply to the open stack, but it's nice to know about and take it into account. Uh, and at that phase, we brought uh, orchestration and telemetry into the mix. So it started to make sense to tenants about uh, that you can write your uh, application as code. We started seeing actually our first adopters uh, started to play around with hit templates. So they are no longer spinning up instances through the Horizon UI or from the CLI. They are writing hit templates with auto scaling groups with provisioning logic built into the hit templates. So it was uh, nice for them. It was also nice for us because we got early feedback. We actually discovered that Sailometer was completely utterly broken in uh, Ice House. Uh, our Juno, uh, our production environment, uh, which is the current thing that we're working on, uh, is built on Juno, heavily patched because we did a lot of backporting from the newer releases. As I said, current release is called Mitakara, so J, L, K, uh, K, L, M. We had a lot of sources to backport stuff to make our thing stable. And in open source, backporting is usually something that you want to do because there's Later, earlier releases may start to become sta more stable. Usually, upstream open source focuses on newer features. So even if we wanted to go to Mitaka or Liberty, the newer releases, we are not sure that the, feature, the newer features were stable enough for us to adopt in production. This is where we're running Juno right now. It's something that's been hardened. We managed to make it uh, fully um, HA. We built HA into the networking layer. And as I said, we backported a lot of patches to make it work with the function, uh, uh, with the functionality of Juno. Uh, and in order for us to be able to operate in production, we had to bring in custom automation. We started with a vendor product, and gradually we moved to something that we supported in house, or we support in house right now. Uh, things that matter when you do this, when you start. Uh, building on OpenStack or building an OpenStack environment in your enterprise or consuming OpenStack in the enterprise. Communication. Communication is key uh, for all the stakeholders in the project. You have to make sure that your tenants know what you're going to do. You have to make sure that your operations team understand how this thing is going to change their lives. And I don't mean it's going to change their lives because the product development guys, and I'm part of that team, uh, don't really take their hands off. The, um, you start working, it, by necessity, you move to a DevOps model where you need to make sure that the, uh, the guys who know the code have access to the production systems and can fix things very early on. Otherwise, this thing, when it starts to scale up, whenever it breaks, it breaks phenomenally. Um, also, your marketing guys, uh, when you're talking about an internal thing, marketing is less involved, but still, uh, the business side needs to be aware of how this thing is going to evolve, how uh, money is going to be charged or recharged between departments, how you're going to uh, scale your investment because uh, you're going to gradually replace your physical hardware with this stuff. So you need to have some capacity uh, management in place to make sure that you scale just in time so it doesn't become too costly to operate. In the end, if you do a cost comparison, you should gradually phase out the human resources towards actual capacity. Uh, very early on, human resources are the most expensive part of your project there. And one key learning that we had in the early, st uh, actually in the middle stages was tenants really like to be separated from other tenants. To quote one of our tenants, I don't want my Bitcoin mining to be interfered by the adjacent tenants Bitcoin mining. Or the other way around, but anyway coming down to Bitcoin mining. Apparently it's a fun thing to do when you're experimenting with something opposed to actually writing useful applications, but hey. Um, another thing that we uh, learned is that if you're gonna over-engineer the thing, uh, you're probably on the wrong track. 
we started out with an uh, enterprise mentality and you know, had to gradually uh, down down our uh, enterprise features. As I said, HA had to be the first thing crossed off the map because it didn't really work. And you need to focus on things that actually matter for your consumers, for you, for your application, uh, for your operations guys. Uh, have a deprecation policy in place. This is not VMware. You don't have DRS, you don't have rebalancing. The only way you can get your resources back from the cloud is by deprecating. Just tell a tenant, terminate any launch. If it's broken, it's broken. We're not gonna fix it. We're gonna swap it. Uh, for anybody familiar with AWS, you when something breaks in AWS, a host breaks, you basically get a notification telling you that in two weeks we're gonna decommission your instance. P please move your stuff away from that because we're gonna terminate it. If you're on EBS volumes, it's nice to just stop and start. If you're on local storage, terminate and launch. And this is the mentality you need to adopt when going towards OpenStack because this is the only way that you can move towards uh, an automated um, environment where basically you don't need to care about smallish type of type of pets. You're just herding cattle. That's the DevOps approach. And keep things small. Um, again, from the traditional enterprise, you're thinking about large servers virtual uh, environments where you build big hosts, throw big giant sandboxes at them, provision 40 gigabytes a second network in the cloud that doesn't add too much value, it actually adds a hell of a lot of cost to it. Uh, now, in the, uh, at some point you're gonna end up, if you're taking the same path that we did, needing help. Uh, if you start out with a vendor, obviously the first place to contact is vendor support. If not, uh, there's a vibrant community around OpenStack. Um, a lot of the guys are hanging out on IRC, some of them on European time zones, a lot of them on uh, US time zones, but you should usually find somebody on IRC on uh, Phenom. Uh, most of the projects have an open, uh, hashtag OpenStack dash service name channel. There's also a socialist kind of uh, site called ask.openstack.org where you can ask questions and somebody will eventually answer, sort of like Stack Exchange, specifically geared towards OpenStack. And there's also the traditional mailing list. Uh, most of the design discussions happen over emails or on a collaboration tool OpenStack uses called Get It. Um, when you start building your thing, evolve in small steps. So start out with something that fits, a minimum viable product, then gradually add features as you discover that you need them, as tenants request them. Don't over-engineer. I cannot uh, overemphasize the don't over-engineer the thing. It's much harder to scale down than to scale up when you need it. And start thinking about carrying your local patches. Uh, upstream releases are basically tagged at one point in time, uh, sort of like a time, a time box uh, releases of uh, the Agile development methodology, they don't really guarantee you that a release uh, is fully stable. So choose a release, make sure that it works for you, then start uh, looking at patches. Either discuss with a vendor to integrate the patches for you or think about integrating those patches by yourself. Start out by building local repositories so your builds become predictable, then start out building actual pa uh, packages for you. And Obviously, in order to roll something that uh, fits your needs, automation is key. Build on whatever tool you feel comfortable with. There's a lot of projects that focus on delivering automation for uh, rolling out of an OpenStack release. For anybody who's already familiar with the DevOps approach, there's Puppet integration, there's Chef integration, there's Ansible. Ansible is actually a very cool project. Please type that. Um, the uh, OpenStack Ansible project is actually uh, built by um, Rackspace and they fully containerize every uh, component, it's fully swappable. And there's a secondary project that uh, tries to do the same thing, it's called Kula. Ansible OpenStack uses uh, LXC for containerization, Kula actually uses just plain Docker. So whatever you feel comfortable running uh, your Docker containers on, Kula supports it. Uh, with that, I'm gonna give the floor to Christiana to talk about our uh, telemetry integration part and our billing system. So, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. So, uh, Christy told us 
as many use for tips and tricks related to an open stack environment and we found out the steps needed to be done in order to have a cloud-based and open stack. I'm co I will continue to present our internal project, which is named OpenWatt. I will speak uh, about the telemetry service in uh, OpenStack, Silometer, and I will give you some insights about our billing system. So uh, let's start with, the, with our um, project, OpenWatt. It's an infrastructure as a service offering. It is designed to be a multi-tenant environment able to host also Orange projects and partners projects. Um, it contains multiple dashboards and panels in Horizon, the OpenStack dashboard, and we have many self-service features like sign up, a user is able to create an account and then to create a project or many other projects. It is able to recover his password. He can manage his quotas. For example, if he has three instances and he wants one more, he can manage his quotas based on uh, the cloud resources. He can manage the networks he is part of um, based on the organization he is part of and based on uh, some groups of networks. He can also um, create some default firewalls and security rules on the project. And also we've, we've implemented some customer experience um, features like sending feedback or uh, um, requesting for um, um, support if they have any issues. Uh, we have a microservices architecture. We implement a um, small architecture that communicates one each other via HTTP and API. We develop in uh, Python. We are using Git as a versioning system, like any other service in OpenStack. Um, next, I will speak more about one of our service. We've recently implemented the, implemented the billing service. This is the schema from the business point of view. So we have many entities involved in this uh, project. We have the development team, um, which customize and uh, develop uh, some services under OpenWatt umbrella. We have the infrastructure teams um, who are in charge with deployments and maintaining. It is a hard work, but it's really nice. We have the happy cloud user that doesn't have to wait two or three weeks for a um, server, but we have the billing department who sends the bill. The if we want to keep this alive, we have to answer the question um, related to the relationship between the business department and the data center. So is there any service in OpenStack that can give us the data related to the um, usage in cloud? There is one. It is called, no, first let's find out what um, billing um, department wants from this uh, data center. They want a report. They want an Excel, so we should give them an Excel. S the Excel should contain uh, multiple information, like they want the total run hours for each instance ID and the type of instance. They want the total run hours for each storage in our cloud and the type of the storage. They want the floating IP usage. Floating A floating IP is the IP needed for an instance to go outside. And they also want the total run hours for each image or snapshot any user creates inside this data center. How do we get this data? Using an open um, stack service, which is called Silometer. Silometer is the data collection service inside OpenStack. And its goal is to provide an infrastructure to collect any information regarding OpenStack project and its resources. It provides customer billing, research tracking, alarming capabilities across all OpenStack's core components. But um, I, I will show you the, um, the architecture of uh, Silometer and then we'll decide if it is okay if this fits our needs. On the left side, we have two agents, compute agent and central agent. The compute agent runs on every compute node and the central agent runs uh, centrally. They take data from the other services. They are pushing this data on the notification bus where the collector takes this data. 
after the collector takes this data, they, um, the collector stores the, uh, the information in a database, in a MongoDB database. This database contains re information related to events, meters, and alarms. After that, anyone can use the, um, the Silometer API to take everything related to events, meters, and alarms. Um, we've seen that um, Silometer has the data we need, but I can show you some um, issues we faced with Silometer. First of all, Silometer is not intended to um, uh, Silometer's database capabilities are not intended for post-processing when responsiveness is a um, requirement. And we need responsiveness because we want to um, create a report with all that uh, data I showed you for each project in our um, cluster. So this is an issue. Another issue is that every day we have 20 gigabytes of data stored in Silometer which is huge. And uh, one requirement from the billing department is to store this data for two years. Imagine two gigabytes for two years every day. This is a lot. No? <laughs> Another issue is that um, in Silometer, we don't have floating IP statistics. There is um, a blueprint open for this, but we don't have yet the code. How do we solve these issues? Using, we use Silometer for, um, for its data, but we um, develop other, uh, develop other uh, services on top of it. So this is our billing service. We can split it in two parts. What's before Elasticsearch and what's after Elasticsearch. So let's start with the first part. The first part contains two collectors, two types of collectors. The first one is the Silometer collectors, which is in charge of uh, collecting the data related to instances, images, volumes, the data we have already in Silometer. But for the other types of events, floating IPs, we implemented another collector. Given the fact that we also need an uh, audit table for floating IPs events, we created another uh, database. This is a MySQL database. And it takes the data from the internal message bus related to any associate or release for every floating IP. So only the things we need. For this database, we created um, a collector. Obviously, it is called MySQL collector. And both uh, collectors are sending data in Elasticsearch. We choose to um, send that data to Elasticsearch because we, we were already accustomed to use Elasticsearch for logging. And with Kibana, it is easy to, we were already accustomed to, to see any data and to analyze data regarding to logs. The other part is the part that generates the report. You see here in this picture that we've implemented multiple processors. Why is this? Because um, every service in OpenStack is implemented by a different team. So we have different data for each different type of message. For instances, for example, this is, I think, the best one. If they have great developer proposal, I don't know what. But for instances, the message contains everything contains the creation date for an instance, the deletion date for an instance, the status, and uh, other meta metadata information. But for volumes, for example, we don't have the deleted that field. We don't know when the, um, the volume was deleted. For images, the deleted add field comes none from Silometer. This is because Silometer makes something and it So, um, We've implemented different processors for each type of uh, resource, and that's how we get our data to the report. That's all from me. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed um, our OpenStack presentation. And now if you have some questions or some remarks for both of us, yeah? What kind of hardware are you, do you have behind this? What? I mean, uh, we talked about cloud 
OpenStack makes it uh, almost irrelevant what hardware you want to place no, behind just, it. I'm just asking um, as, a, as a ballpark. I mean, okay. so an example of a service that you're running and what kind of hardware. And as an idea, scaling, OpenStack. What, uh, yeah. Okay. One of the design goals or one of the design principles in OpenStack is keep the blast radius small. So you don't want to provide it large boxes that when they fail, take, I don't know, 200 instances with them. Uh, our design principle is uh, either blade servers with two CPUs or standalone servers with two CPUs. Our uh, evolution direction goes actually towards standalone servers. Well, the traditional data center says do massive blade chassis, try to put as much in a rack as possible. Um, one thing that you need to uh, take into account is the blast radius. And by blast radius, I mean, if you're going to, use, uh, going to use blades, you need to store instances somewhere. And blades don't have a lot of local storage, you need to put that into a centralized storage. When you have lots of blades hitting the centralized storage, you're gonna hammer it, and everybody's gonna feel bad, everybody's gonna feel the impact of somebody doing heavy IO towards a centralized data store. So our design goal says, put a local, uh, give the instances ephemeral storage or local storage, and provide a local uh, central store for everything else. We provide Cinder uh, hosted by Ceph. So again, an analogy to AWS, uh, EBS volumes. If you want to put persistent data, so it's not tied to the lifetime of the instance, not tied to the lifetime of the physical box, we provide an option to keep data in a centralized, replicated, distributed data store. But Instance volumes are actually hosted on the local disks of uh, the physical boxes. They're small, like as a ballpark, uh, eight core uh, CPUs with hyper-threading. Um, two questions, this might be because um, I wasn't that familiar with OpenStack before the talk, so I may be getting the wrong yep. impression, but uh, you mentioned, you know, there's you need to stay a few versions behind to make sure you get a certain degree of stability. Yep. There is also seems to be a bit of a, one of your suggestions pa was backport the patches yourself because this may not happen to the community. Uh, it depends on how far you are behind. The community actually maintains uh, two backwards releases. In our case, we are three versions behind, so this is why we have to do the backports. Basically, there is a, st a current stable, an old stable, and the in-development release. So any uh, security features, any stability uh, patches that get developed to, for the in development usually get ported to stable and uh, old stable or back ported to old stable and old stable. So if you're at least at old stable stage, you get the back ports for free. Otherwise you need to validate them. There's also a matter of uh, logic. For example, not all patches may apply to you, but if somebody patches certain behavior in a file that you also use, but you're just not touching that particular part of code that they patched, the patch may need some tweaking in order to be cleanly applied to your environment. Um, let, uh, let me give you an example. For example, for, uh, in Neutron, uh, there's a larger driver library, but there's a central um, library file that uh, contains shared function that, uh, uh, functions that a driver may use we needed to patch certain uh, router behavior and uh, there are two other patches that were uh, relevant to um, um, I think F5 or maybe Cisco driver. They basically changed the offsets and changed the signature of a function and the same function we needed to patch for a security uh, issue on the reference implementation. So we ended up having to modify that or end up having to slightly tweak the patch in order to apply to our environment. This is what I'm uh, talking about. If you're going to apply uh, complex patches, things that change behaviors, then it becomes even more complicated. Uh, for example, again, coming to Neutron because it's my area of expertise. Um, in uh, the Kilo release, they introduced a um, process manager. So in Juno, the version that we're using, it just spins up processes and hopes they never die. Uh, the process manager basically makes sure that if a uh, child process dies, it's respawned. And the infrastructure for that particular patch is very complex. So what we ended up was doing an external um, monitoring of those processes and restarting them if they die. So those are the kind of patches that you have to care about most of the time. The best practice is try to stay not too far behind mainline because in that case you basically get the patches for free. Uh, 